welcome back to the channel everybody so today we have some xrp news we have some bitcoin news we have some banking news and uh it's pretty big you know when a billionaire starts sounding starts sounding like me you know it's a problem all right so but we're going to begin right here um this article is titled ripple evm sidechain activates new xrp amendment all right so let's find out what's going on here it says here in a significant move ripple partner peer Sist announces that new amendments to the xrpl evm sidechain have been activated following community approval two amendments that have been applied will enable new transaction fees in xrp and the activation of cosmos ibc this is on may the 1st peer Sist launched two new key proposals 33 and 34 uh, to upgrade the network to adjust xrp fees and enable ibc and cosmos tokens respect respectively scrolling down scrolling down past the tweets says amendment 33 would allow updating the network's gas price to make the configuration more similar to production environments this step is critical for the network security and scalability transaction fees should be minimal comparable to binance smart chain or polygon it says Amendment 34 will activate IBC channels, connecting the network to uh, the Cosmos ecosystem and enabling cross-chain applications. The community approved the amendments, which are now in effect following a seven-day voting period uh, that ended on May the 6th. The Ripple EVM sidechain, a proof-of-concept extension to the XRPL protocol, is designed to bring full programmability to the XRPL ecosystem. It enables developers to employ EVM applications on the XRPL with a few changes, uh, eliminating the requirement for network votes for each application. The EVM sidechain uses a proof of authority consensus method and is directly connected to the XRP ledger via the XRPL bridge. The core technology for the XRPL sidechain consensus is Comet BFT, a fork of Tendermint that is a Byzantine fault tolerant engine for blockchain development. With the new update, the XRPL EVM sidechain might become more appealing to developers who wish to test it for their applications as it is not yet available on the production mainnet. All right, we'll stop right there. So good things are happening on the XRPL. Let's move on here. And like before we get to this next article here, right? I'll say this. I'm super bullish on XRP, especially if we get past this case, get past this case. I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this right here. If we get past this case, I think most of the bank coins, if they do what they're supposed to do, if the companies, you know, uh, utilize their partnerships the right way, maybe bring in a lot of new partnerships because there will be clarity. We get past this. Uh, we get past this case, which I know a lot of people are celebrating, saying it's pretty much over already and they might be right. Um, but I, I need to hear that first. I need to hear, hey, listen, this is what's happening. Um, you know, they're not going to pay the two billion. There's something else. Then they have to pay it, whatever it's going to be, if that indeed happens. Right. And then they say, hey, it's done. When when they say it's done, then I'm going to say it's done. That's how I feel. You know, I, I try not try not to celebrate before time too much. But but yes, things are looking really, really good, in my humble opinion. Um, but I'll say this. I'm super bullish on XRP. XLM, Algorand, listen, you know the usual suspects. Quant, I'm super, I'm going to say Quant, I'm super duper bullish on Quant. Once again, nothing in, nothing I'm saying is financial advice. I'm just giving my opinion because people ask me about this a lot. Um, uh, I'm super duper bullish on Quant. Uh, I'm, I'm bullish on Flare, Hedera, HBAR, um, LCX, Zenfin, XDC. Uh, I'm super duper bullish on Songbird right songbird so we'll put that out there um i'm trying to think i'm trying not to leave any any bank coins out oh let me not forget chain link super duper bullish on chain link uh and i'm super bullish on solana all right so i don't think i forgot anything right so that's how i feel about <laughs> that's how i feel about those um but i'll tell you what over time you know what's weird i know a lot of other people 
uh, probably have become less bullish on XRP. I've actually become more bullish on XRP considering the state of the banks. I'm just being honest with you. You know, I'm, I'm a person who watches what's going on in the financial sy system very closely and has been looking really bad. And it seems more and more that they're getting exposed on how much they need the new financial system. Just my humble opinion, folks. You don't have to you don't have to agree with me. Um, but anyway, let's move on to this next article. But I figured I'd share that. I get a lot of questions about that all the time. Um, so now. This article here is titled, not true, but plausible, not true, but plausible. That is so interesting. It says Ripple CTO breaks silence as to whether he is Satoshi. Um, I also want to give a shout out to AMPOV podcast. Big shout out um, and a big shout out to Matthew. All right. I appreciate you. It says Ripple CTO David Schwartz sparks entry as he addresses speculation linking him to Bitcoin's mysterious creator, <laughs> creator <laughs> Satoshi Nakamoto, at XRP Las Vegas 2024. People, are <laughs> I'm telling you, listen, there's a reason why people believe it, it might be David Schwartz. I believe David Schwartz is one of the Satoshis. I believe there's a group. I said this before, but people are hot on his trail. Well, anyway, let's let me read this. It says at the annual XRP Las Vegas 2024 conference, David Schwartz, Ripple's current chief technology officer, found himself once again fielding, fielding inquiries regarding any potential connection to Satoshi Nakamoto, the elusive creator of Bitcoin. It says Schwartz, renowned for his uh, contribution to cryptography and as one of the original architects of the XRP ledger, along with Arthur Brito. And Jed McCaleb responded to questions about his purported identity as Nakamoto with a firm denial, as Satoshi Nakamoto should. It says he clarified that while he possessed the requisite skill set, he only became aware of Bitcoin in 2011, well after, well after its inception, stating that he wished he had discovered it earlier. Hmm. No doubt that, listen, I love what Satoshi did, but I will say I wouldn't put it past him to be capable of telling a fib or two or a lie or two. It says here, uh, <laughs> his assertion stemmed from his admission that his introduction to Bitcoin occurred relatively late. And he also emphasized his unfamiliarity with the QT interface, a crucial aspect of the early Bitcoin code, which further distanced him from any association with Nakamoto. What do you what do you what do you guys think? You think that um you think he's telling the truth? It sounds like it. Sounds like he might be telling the truth. But I I swear, a lot of what he does, a lot of what he says, as well as his background, um, man, it really maybe he's maybe he's saying he's not Satoshi Nakamoto based on the technicality. Maybe he's not the prime Satoshi. I always thought that he was the prime Satoshi. You know, maybe there's a group of three, right? And then he's the, I thought he would be the prime, but maybe what if he's not, maybe he's just one of the supporting Satoshis, right? And then if you read a lot of what Satoshi, the Satoshi information that was put out there, sometimes it's, it sounds like different people speaking, just my humble opinion. Um, that's what lead, one thing that leads me to believe that there may be mul multiple, maybe a group. So maybe he's not the prime. So that's why he can say, Hey, I'm not Satoshi, you know, is it? It's like, technically, you're not that prime Satoshi. Techn technically, you didn't have to know about these particular things if you were just a supporting member. You get what I'm saying? Is that a possibility? You think that's a possibility? I don't know. This is going to be something interesting. People are going to be trying to unravel for quite some time. All right. So now let's move on here to, to the banking news. All right. This is going to be very brief, but it's very, very impactful. All right. So uh, and this should tell people what's coming. I've been saying this for a long time. You saw the other articles and the data about banks, multitude of banks collapsing. Now, listen to what this billionaire has to say. So this is from finance.yahoo.com. And the, the, the headline itself kind of sort of just gives you everything. The headline is titled Billionaire Real Estate Investor Barry Sternlicht. So you can look this up for yourself, says he expects at least one bank failure per week due to real estate loans. I told you commercial real estate. That's why we cover it so much. That commercial real estate is something terrible for banks. Didn't I tell you? So now you're hearing it from a billionaire. 
I, listen, I, I, I can't tell people what to do, but I say if you, if you deal with banks heavily, I will be checking my bank to make sure it's my, my money is safe because if they go under, they can always do the buy-ins or bail-ins. Sorry about that. Not buy-ins. The bail-ins. And most people are not expecting this. I wonder if people talk to their family members and their friends and stuff. Just it's, it's a protective thing. It's a protective thing. It has nothing to do with fear. This is real. Right. This is real. You know, I don't know about everyone else, but I don't want myself or anyone close to me losing money to a system that is not being run properly. I'll leave it at that. I'm trying to keep my um, <laughs> giving my thoughts to a bare minimum today. All right. I've been heavy on just heavy on. Uh, I've been like 50 50 with reading articles and then putting a lot of my thoughts out there. So I'm trying to give people a change of pace just in case they, they like the more direct approach to just reading. Like it's, it's like uh. 70% reading articles and like 30% of my thoughts. We'll see how people react to this. But it says here, that's a, fra this is what he said, quote, that's a fragile animal right now, unquote. Look at, look at how he phrases it. First of all, he's, he's calling the banks an animal. That's number one. That's not, that's very, very uh, uh, pointed words. But he says it's a fragile, fragile animal. The banking system. All right. There you have it, folks. All right. <laughs> if that doesn't get a if that doesn't get a solid click on the like button where the like stays, I don't know. I don't know what will. All right. So now. <laughs> oh, man, I hope you're all doing fantastic out there. You know, um, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're healthy. OK. Um, and I hope your your loved ones are doing well. Let's move on here. We got a little bit of Bitcoin news to get to here. So now. This article is titled Bitcoin Ab about to blow higher despite this week's pullback, according to Glassnode, Glassnode co-founders. Here's why. Let's scroll down, find out what's going on. What do they think? I think it's going to take some time, of course, but I don't see this going any different than how 2021 went. It looks like it's repeating the exact same process. 2020, 2021, and now and now. It says the founders of crypto analytics platform Glassnode are predicting that Bitcoin will soon soar even higher after being up 7% in the last week. It says in a new trend, I think it was down a little bit today. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's been a busy two days, folks. My apologies. Um, I, I was able to pop into the comment section last night at the event. I went to one event last night then I had to attend another event this morning. Um, so it's been super busy. I haven't been able to keep up with every single thing. But while I'm on the go, I'm able to scroll sometimes and get some articles and uh, still do a little bit of research. It relaxes me. Um, so anyway, it says in a new trend, the co-founders of Glassnode who go by the handle Negentropic, Negentropic on the social media platform X tell their followers that th that key indicators suggest Bitcoin is gearing up from a ma from a massive breakout. I think they mean they meant for a massive breakout. It says the analysts say Bitcoin appears to be forming a bullish uh, pennant pattern. They also suggest that Bitcoin is correcting to a Fibonacci retracement level in the low $60,000 range. It says which often predicts a continuation of an upward trend. Quote, Bitcoin still looks like it is about to blow higher. Last week's candle was a reversal candle, a hammer with a long wick. Price moved back into the pennant structure. This candle still dominates the, stru the structure. The structure. This week's pullback, hence, seems like a healthy correction before higher. Uh, it says corrections often pull back either 50% or 61.8%. It says of the previous impulses move, unquote. I like how they're putting this all together, nice and concise. And from what I've read from other experts and analysts, um, seems like this is pretty pretty uh, spot on. It says, looking at their chart, the analyst suggests that Bitcoin has or is about to complete a three wave ABC correction. The Elliott wave theory states that uh, bu that a bullish asset often witnesses a fresh leg up after an ABC correction of three wave impulses. Uh, the analysts believe Bitcoin could break through the $85,000 level before the start of the summer, which officially begins on June 20th. Quote, Bitcoin is currently in the process of breaking the trend line of pennant and the 50-day SMA, simple moving average. 
It says when the level of 65,000 uh, to 66,000 is broken, Bitcoin will move on to to first 73,500 and 76,500. And chances are that we are that we see eighty five thousand two hundred dollars before the something before the summer. Wow. Unquote. Whoa. Wow. We, we shall see. I would love that. I would love that. And I would like to see it pull everything else up. I'm telling you right now. Um, so we shall see if, if that comes true. OK. All right, folks. So now let's move on here. So now this article here, more banking news. This article here is titled the increasingly blurred lines between banks and NBFIs. Everything is changing right before everyone's eyes. Once upon a time, it begins as such. Banks were bigger than non-bank financial institutions. Those days are now a dim and distant memory. The blame for this is usually laid at the door of regulators. One justification for regulating banks much more heavily than NBFIs is that they matter more. They matter more. Yeah. Well, like I said, I'll try to keep some of my thoughts to myself for now. Banks do different things like take deposits and can't be allowed to fail. NBFIs like mutual funds, pensions and insurance firms can die without summoning the end of days or so one goes or, or so one view goes. But aren't you supposed to just overall just be concerned with the people? Right. You're supposed to protect the people. That's what regulations are about. That's what they claim is about protecting the investor, and the, the customers. It says another. That's what they say. Another perspective on NBFIs is that they are sneaky critters which creep around regulatory perimeters and eat banks lunches. Well, they do good. They, I'll say this. They do good business. They offer like, stuff that they have. They offer good yield. It says uh, think pesky and they offer liquidity a lot of times. Think pesky private credit funds that lend to firms, mutual funds that buy corporate bonds, etc. In this characterization, NBFIs will have to be rescued from time to time when they blow up. It says in both worlds, NBFIs sort of run in parallel with the banking system as an under-regulated big brother. It says it had little, but it crossed it out, of course. Um, this is what, and this is a part of what they call shadow banks, right? Shadow banking. Let's just put that in there, okay? It says, uh, and at the very least, they add diversification to the financial ecosystem. And that's another thing. See how they're the big brother now? The banks want to compete with them, folks. So the banks need, they need um, DLT lending. They need the wallets. They need the low transaction fees. They need to loosen up Nostro. They need uh, smart contracts. They need to be able to uh, offer staking to their to their client, to their customers and clients. Not only that, they need to, they want to stake as well, in my humble opinion. I think that's really when you're going to see crypto go crazy. They need the tokenization of real world assets and true interoperability, which none of them have right now. Um, they need that. We offer that. Once again, this is why I'm super bullish on the new financial system. XRP, Algorand, Algorand, uh, XLM, uh, Quant, uh, Flare, Songbird, Chainlink, Solana, Zenfin, LCX. You know, it's not that many. You want to be honest. Um, but I think they're all doing a very, very good job. But they're just being hampered right now because of regulations and regulators. That's very, that's very clear. Um, and also, if you see that video, I believe I posted this morning in the members only section. And I think around the 15 minute mark, go, go to around the 15 minute mark of when that individual is talking. Um, they say something similar about why things are slow in the United States, right? They say a lot with saying a little. All right, but that tells you a lot. That means that when that bar that 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 uh, barrier is removed, theoretically speaking, everything should be able to run a lot more, do a lot more, be bigger, better. The value that comes in, that the, the opportunity for it, the possibility to bring in large value also should theoretically increase. Uh, once again, not financial advice, just my humble, humble opinion. Uh, it says here, these are the questions tackled by Viral 
Acharya, former deputy governor of the Reserve Bank of India and now of NYU, Nicola Settarelli of the FRBNY, and Bruce Tuckman of the NYU. Their answer became the keynote paper at Riksbank Conference last year we've only just landed upon. It says... The authors run through a bunch of examples of this interdependence, which will be familiar to some regular regular readers. These range from the sale of $2.3 billion of loans from PacWest to Aries via Barclays in the regional bank crisis of March 2023, Blackstone private credit funds, 19 secured credit commitment facilities, REIT's use of bank credit lines as warehouse financing, European electricity producers' derivative use to the UK's very own pensions LDI crisis. They uh, present their findings as a big old table at the back of their paper, uh, which, wow, they have a nice little chart here. Actually, this is from financialtimes.com. Just in case you want to check this out, folks, this article is really, really good. It says, Quote, banks are not particularly asset or liability dependent on a on any particular MBFI subsector. Several MBFI subsectors are asset or liability dependent on banks. Let's ex uh, then it says let's explore. We're not going to dive too deep into that. But look at that relationship there. Right now. I don't think I think what they need to tackle here and maybe they do later on in this article is not the dependency or interdependency. Right. It's the fear that the banking system, the financial system, which I'm going to throw the regulators in there because they sort of work hand in hand. Um, they take it very easy on the banks. They're all sort of connected. The fear that they have of NBFIs and their dominance. Once again, you see how they crossed out little. They used to be the little brother. Now they're the big brother. They're taking a lot of bank, a lot of bank, a lot of business away from the banks because they can offer things the banks can't. They can do things the banks can't. Um, and and. Although I would like to deposit, I mean, deposit, <laughs> I would like to um, give a lot of credit to crypto commodities uh, and, and other things for and, and also the banks just hurting, hurt, hurting their own reputations for the massive deposit flight that has been going on. Um, let's be real. NBFIs have a lot to do with that. They have a lot to do with that. Um, so they're in there. So now they're so they're major, major competition to the banks and they're a major uh, detriment or hindrance to the bank's domination. Once again, another reason why I believe that they need and they are congealing with the new financial system. We get past this SEC case. Let's see what happens. Maybe maybe after that, we get a little bit of clarity. I think that brings clarity to a few of the bank coins. I could be wrong, but I believe that. And um, maybe after that, we get even more clarity for just outright utility coins. Who knows? Um, anything is possible for the future. I'm feeling very positive about the future. Um, that could change, but it hasn't changed as of now. So now let's close out here. I have two articles left. One about, well, both of them are XRP related. One is about the SEC. And then one is about someone's opinion on why xrp could make you rich uh you know what let's go with the sec here because um i would like to get an update on that on what's going on so far so this article is titled sec argues two billion dollar penalty against ripple is needed slams 10 million dollar counter proposal i would love for someone to bring up i don't know if they will the lawyers i'm not a lawyer of course so I would hope they know better than I do. But remember when the SEC was was lamenting, crushing, uh, what was it, LBRY? And they were like, maybe this, they, they, they pulled back the fine that like broke LBRY and they lessened it, even though it was already too late. Um, and I believe there was some verbiage coming out of them uh, akin to maybe this was too much. Use that against them. That's why I say, I say use that against them. But anyway, this article begins as such. The SEC has said that Ripple should pay close to $2 billion in fines for selling XRP to institutional investors. Ripple has argued that the figure should be closer to $10 million, which is reasonable in my humble opinion. It says here, the Securities and Exchange Commission is pushing back against Ripple's claim that it should pay fewer fines, according to a recent uh, court filing. What, they reiterate from the top what they said at the top again. 
It says, in his opposition motion filed last month, Ripple argued, well, we know about the 10 million. Let's skip that part. Quote, to the contrary, it would encourage other crypto asset issuers. This is from the SEC. It says to violate Section 5 by making it a remarkably lucrative endeavor and thus deprive investors the disclosures Congress mandates as a mere cost of doing business, the SEC lawyer said. How? I, I don't understand anything about the SEC at this particular time and how any of this. Well, let's keep going. The SEC and Ripple have been battling in court for years after the SEC accused the firm of raising. Well, you know the whole story there. It says the SEC and Ripple have made billions of dollars. Uh, uh, SEC said Ripple had made billions of dollars in institutional sales of XRP. Then there's a section here titled flashing licenses. I'm trying to get to the important stuff here, folks. A lot of this stuff we know. It says uh, flashing licenses. The SEC also criticized Ripple's assurances to the court that it would not again violate the law in the future. Quote, Ripple also assures the court it need not be worried about whether Ripple could again violate the U.S. securities law by pointing to different licenses it has obtained from different jurisdictions, including those Ripple explains do not treat XRP sales as sales of securities, unquote. The SEC's lawyers wrote on Tuesday, quote, this argument akin to saying a New York restaurant need not obtain a liquor license because it obtained a fishing license in California is absurd, unquote. That's ridiculous. Ripple chief legal officer, Officer Stewart, you know what it shows me is that most of these regulatory agencies are not on one accord. But if I, I, it makes no sense, shouldn't all of them be on one accord across the United States? But they're not. It's, it's unbelievable how that works. This is not a restaurant. This is an international business. Right. <laughs> it says a uh, big difference. This is Ripple chief legal officer. Stuart Alderati pushed back on the SEC statement in a post on X Tuesday morning, quote, and just when you think the SEC can't sink any lower. If you are a financial regulator outside the U.S. and have done the hard work of establishing comprehensive crypto licensing frameworks, know that the SEC has no respect for you and thinks you are handling you are handing out the equivalent of fishing licenses, unquote, Alderati said. All right. So, you know, we'll we'll keep up to date with this and. um See how everything uh, shakes out so far. It was looking pretty good. Uh, one of the lawyers the other day, I believe I read, if I read correctly, that they said things are looking good. Um, I believe, was it Stuart Alderati that said we're closer to this case being over, closer than ever? Uh, I believe we covered that article in one of the last two videos. So now that you have that information, what are you going to do with it? I know what I'm going to do with this. So until next time, everybody, let's get to the money.